All right, everybody, welcome to our last talk um, of the SIPA uh, this year. So by Anthony and Dri. Uh, we'll be talking about combining various types of STDPs to learn efficient neural codes. All right, so I'll bring it, your talk to the main stage. I'll put myself away and you're ready to go. All right, let's go. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for being here. I'm um, Anthony Indri, a PhD student at University Clermont Ferry, and more precisely at Institute Pascal. I'm working under the supervision of Céline Tolliard, also at Institute Pascal, and Joren Trich at Frankfurt Institute for Advanced Studies. I will be presenting you our work on the combination of various types of spectrum independent plasticity to learn efficient neural codes. So first of all, our work comes under the efficient coding hypothesis, which postulates that neurons maximize information with only a few spikes. If we take the example of a visual cortex that would receive visual stimuli from the eye, we may notice that the way that it would process this, sort of, this type of stimulus is vastly different from the way other areas would process fares, such as your auditory cortex, which would process sounds differently. So we first have an adaptation of codes to the sensory area. And second, we know that um, in simple cells, in early pathways of visual cortex, we have response properties that are similar to Geber filters, such that, ex such that they exhibit um, res responses to bars of various orientations, frequencies, phases, and specific polarities in the receptive fields. They are, um, examples of efficient coding in the brain. We also have um, different transmission constraints in the brain, such as um, the need to compress codes in order to efficiently send them, and also the fact that these codes need to be compressed because there is um, a need for energy, because neurons cannot spike indefinitely. So there's a need to compress those codes in order to have a sparse code. And coming from that, there's a subpart of efficient coding that would be predictive coding, which postulates that um, neurons will not send their whole um, representation of input, but rather only the unpredictable parts of those processed stimuli. And in my work, um, I propose predictive coding light, which is a spiking predictive coding model. And this predictive coding model differs from um, classical predictive coding approaches, where with classical predictive coding, you would have the sensory input that is received from different groups of neurons, that would be error neurons and representation neurons here. We would have predictions that come from higher states in the hierarchy. And lastly, what would be transmitted would be only these prediction errors. And here we propose a spiking approach of this predictive coding. Um, coding theory and in our in our application we we consider only one type of neuron that would be presentation neurons and we consider that we suppress the most predictable spikes with predictions that come flowing um, from higher stages but also at the same stage with lateral connection and lastly what we sent to later to deeper layers would be the compressed representation because our predictions are conveyed through inhibition and we suppress effects that could be predicted by other layers, by other cells. So here we basically propose predictive coding light, a light predictive coding approach that reduces redundancy. Our contributions are such as we have a fully plastic predictive coding light making our network, um, the learning of receptive fields that will be simple cell and complex cell receptive fields with response properties similar to what is observed in biological cells, and also um, surround suppression and cross orientation suppression that are biological phenomena that are observed in the brain. And lastly, we also systematically compare spike timing dependent plasticity rules, such as the causal SCDP, where we do uh, potentiation when the postsynaptic neuron spikes after the presynaptic neuron and a depression in the other case. The Nakoda SCDP, where we invert the potentiation and the depression. And a symmetric SCDP, where we realize only a potentiation. Moving from that, on this slide, you can now see our predictive coding light architecture, where we have two layers, a simple cell layer and a complex cell layer that are inspired from simple cells and complex cells. 
Our simple cellular receives, in, receives input from um, an event-based pixel array, and it will perform an operation similar to a convolutional fit to a convolutional layer in artificial neural networks. It will then feed to a complex cell layer that will perform an operation similar to a pooling layer. And in both type of layers, we have a local inhibitory mechanism such that um, simple cells or complex cells that are located at the same location would inhibit each other so that they can learn different filters, different receptive fields. On top of that, specifically for simple cells, we have a lateral inhibition mechanism such that simple cells can receive also inhibition from other cells that are located at different zones in the cortical map. And we also have a top-down inhibition mechanism that where complex cells inhibit simple cells from their input zone. And it is basically through this lateral and top-down inhibition that predictions are conveyed, as complex cells would inhibit simple cells from spiking if this information is already present in the neural code, and same for other simple cells that would prevent similar spikes from happening. We also have other neuron and synaptic mechanisms, such as a refractory period that we apply on our leaky integrate and fire simple and complex cells, um, a weight sharing mechanism that is applied on our excitatory and local inhibitory weights, and a soft band synaptic plasticity, and lastly, a synaptic weight L1 normalization. We also stress that all of our weights are fully plastic as we learn um, the excitatory and inhibitory weights with SCDP rules. And moving from that, um, we were interested in um, training our network with a sort of with type of stimuli that are generally observed in early visual experience. So we converted natural images to an event stream using an event-based camera simulator and trained a PCL network with a causal SCDP rule. We were able to um, to obtain simple cells receptive fields that could be fitted to GABA filters, and we have um, on the top the simple cells receptive fields and on the bottom the GABA filters. We have receptive fields that exhibit various orientations, frequencies, phases, and a specific order of polarities. But, but as they were adapted to the statistics that could be seen in the natural images. And we know that biological simple and complex cells have certain preferences regarding their stimuli, and we wanted to see if these preferences are still seen with our, sim our simple and complex cells. So now I'm showing the orientation tuning curve where we recorded the responses of our simple and complex cells to counterface sinusoidal grating that would be grating that, that change polarities following a sinusoidal signal. And we had such counterface sinusoidal gratings with different orientations, frequencies, and phases. And here I'm plotting the orientation tuning curve where you have on the axis the orientation difference between the preferred stimulus of a simple or a complex cell uh, with a sample that is um, in fact seen by the cell. And on the ordinate, you have a normalized number of spikes. So we then notice that both of our cells are orientation selective as they give a maximal response for um, their preferred stimulus and a minimal response when we get far from this preference. We also defined a simple metric where we simply calculated the sum of the difference between the maximal response and all of our stimuli and we averaged over the sum and we obtained values that are similar for both types of cells. Moving on from that, we also know that simple cells have a selectivity to the polarity, while complex cells are supposed to be invariant. So we recorded the responses of our neurons to those counterface in solidal gratings and plotted it as a function of time. So we noticed that simple cells give a maximal response for what for one type of polarity and a minimal response for another, while our complex cells give a maximal response regardless of the polarity that is being saved. And so we indeed have an invariance to polarity for complex cells. Um, we defined also a simple metric that would be um, averaging over, over time the responses of both simple and complex cells. And we indeed have a relatively high value for complex cells as they are invariant, invariant to polarity and a relatively low value for simple cells. Moving on from that, we, were, um, we also have the frequency tuning curve 
where we observe that our impulse cells and complex cells present um, receptivity to a frequency, although we notice that our simple cells have a sharper decrease and a, a stronger receptivity compared to complex cells. Lastly, we have a phase tuning curve where we um, notice that complex cells develop a sort of invariance to the phase, whereas impulse cells um, have a sharp decrease with a difference of phase with a preferred symmetry. So overall, those response properties for simple and complex cells roughly match what is observed with biological cells in um, the visual cortex. But on top of that, we are also interested into looking at, at different suppressive effects that can be normally seen with um, decoding networks, such as strand suppression and cross orientation suppression, where in strand suppression, if we consider that we simulate the uh, centered neuron with a bar of increasing length, you will notice that the response will start by increasing. And when the receptive field is completely excited, and we also simulate the surrounding neurons, we'll notice that that response will start to slowly decrease. This is roughly the surround suppression phenomenon. And in the cross orientation suppression phenomenon, we have um, surrounding neurons and center neurons that have different orientations. And in this case, we have a, a high response, whereas when we have um, the same orientation for both surrounding and center neurons, we should have a low response. And we, to assess for this phenomenon, we um, recorded the responses of our simple cells with bars of increasing length, uh, with and without our lateral and top-down inhibitory mechanisms. So we notice that with the increase in length of our of our bars, we first have this increase in the response, and afterwards, when we do not have any lateral top down inhibition, we see that the response becomes um, constant. Meanwhile, with our lateral and top down inhibition, the response will start to decrease with the length of a bar as there is a communication between neurons such that they sent inhibition to suppress any spike that can already be predicted by the surroundings. We also see a cross orientation suppression phenomenon where if we record the responses of our neurons with, with um, bars of different orientation for both surrounding and center neurons, we notice that the suppression is maximal when we have um, or same orientations in surrounding and center. Meanwhile, when the the orientation do not match, we have a relatively high response in comparison. And lastly, we were interested into comparing different learning rules that would be our causal, causal and symmetric SCDP rules. Um, so here I'm plotting basically the performance of our complex cells with regard to the different parameters and the different learning rules that were used. And we made it so that the higher the bar, the, best, the better the performance regarding the known complex and simple cell parameters. And the labels are such that the first letter will denote the rule that was used for the excitatory synapses, and the, the second one, the rule that was used for the inhibitory synapses. We also did not consider um, the last three combinations, as we saw that using an ACOSA learning rule to learn excitatory um, weights couldn't enable us to um, obtain simple cell receptive fields that could be fitted to Gebauer filters. So here with the complex cells, we observe that most rules give similar results when combined, apart from rules that are using an, inhibit an inhibitory um, causal rule. And a similar effect can be observed with a frequency. Meanwhile, for the phase, we observe a relative phase invariance for an acosal learning rule, while other rules are sensitive in comparison. And lastly, with the polarity, all rules give similar results. And similar effect can be observed with, um, with simple cells, as we notice that an acosal learning rule give, um, give um, low performance compared to other rules for the orientation to frequency and also the phase. Um, and with all of that being said, I would like to give some highlights of this predictive coding light network that I presented. As we have, we have fully plastic SCDP lent weights with 
excitation, local inhibition for simple cells and complex cells. And we also have a lateral inhibition and top-down inhibition in simple cells and from complex cells to simple cells. We have simple cell and complex cell-like response properties with selectivity and invariance properties that arise. And lastly, that our most predictable spikes are suppressed as varies to on suppression and cross-orientation suppression. We also observe that different combinations of SCDP rules with this causal, a causal and symmetric SCDP give surprisingly similar results. And it will be interesting now for us in um, for future work to um, implement such um, such a BCL network on neuromorphic chip. And um, another future work that we would be interested in doing is looking at the perceptual effects that could arise in deep PCR networks. It will also be interesting to add um, other um, mechanisms such as a recurrent, such as recurrent excitation, but also delays in our networks. And um, yeah, I think that I've said more or less what I wanted to say. And I would like to thank you for your attention during this presentation. And also thank you for having voted this uh, my abstract and um, permitting this talk to happen in the first place. So, yeah, um, thank you, and um, I will be delighted to answer your potential questions. Okay, thank you, Anthony, for uh, this talk. Uh, so, we have time for a couple of uh, questions. Um, I'll start with the first one that I currently see. Um, why not also add top down excitation, or at least why was inhibition chosen over excitation? This is, uh, by Karim Habashi. Um, we, chose ex we chose inhibition mainly because uh, the idea was to suppress the predictable spikes. So, with inhibition, and we, not we noticed that with inhibition, we wouldn't have problems such as, um, such as um, having um, um, networks that would still um, excite. Um, be excited by by themselves. So it will be interesting for us to study those those sorts of frequently excitatory networks later on. But for now, in order to just suppress spikes and have a light architecture, we prefer using only frequent inhibition. Okay. Next question is by Marcus Gosch. Um, one of the interesting findings from the brain score benchmark uh, from the MIT folks is that feedforward models seem to best match the activity of cells in the ventral visual stream. Uh, for example, early areas detect edges and so on, which maybe suggests that these properties can arise without feedback. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, yeah. In, in this case, we mainly use feedback to also learn those predictive coding effects with um, this round suppression and cross orientation suppression, where we notice that without, um, without any feedback that may be lateral and top down, we do not have any sort of suppression. Meanwhile, when we add them, we have this communication between neurons that enables predictable spikes to be suppressed. Um, so that is roughly the idea behind it. And I believe that it would be possible for us to obtain still simple cell and complex cell like response properties with, without those feedback mechanisms if we were to still modi modify a little bit our hyperparameters, but it should be possible. OK. Next question is uh, for myself. Um, I, I, I kind of sense the elements of sparse coding here. Um, and I was wondering, since you're training these lateral weights, um, do you also see that the, uh, the lateral weights are proportional to the overlap in the receptive fields? This is what you would expect in sparse coding. Mm, um, I didn't exactly look at the distribution with respect to the, to the overlap between the receptive fields, but yes, that would be interesting. Um, in fact, we notice that the, the stronger, the stronger super, suppressive effect happen when we are at, we are relatively close to the 
Hmm. It's a receptive field where here we have a receptive field of 10 pixels. And after over 10 more pixels, we notice that the suppression become relatively constant compared to earlier on. So I believe it could be observed, but yeah, I, okay. I, will, I will look at that. All right, so let's go with the last one. So did you test whether the learned representation confer advantages on downstream tasks? On, on, down, on downstream tasks, such as, I'm, I'm not sure I understand. But By I'm, downstream task, I suppose this is basically, um, say, a classification task or some task that's different from the one that you use to learn these weights. Okay. Um, so basically, we um, in the manuscript that we will um, submit later on at the end of the year, we have results with um, more complex sets. Um, such as the administ, um, DVS gesture, and also the NCAR set, where we have um, better encoding when we use um, those suppressive effects compared to when we would use a random suppressive effect that would be free, just um, removed those spikes randomly instead of using our learned inhibition. So, indeed, the, this inhibition has an effect, and we are um, can classify um, different objects or representation better with it than with a random scheme. We still obtain results that, that are relatively similar to what you would obtain without these suppressed schemes. Okay, great. So that's the uh, end of our questions. Um, and also the end of SNUFA. 23. So we'll have bring in. Uh, well, let's thank the speaker again and bring in the uh, uh, organizers. For thank the final and thank you for everyone. It's it's been great. I've really enjoyed this as as I do every year. It's uh, it's it's a really nice community uh, and a really nice workshop, and we always see nice work. So thank you everyone to. Uh, Everyone who spoke and, and everyone who came along and asked great questions and, and made it a great event again. Thank you. Yeah, you too for me. Thanks so much um, to the co organizers, all the speakers, everybody who joined, and see you next year. Yeah. Oh, and come and come and join our Discord and tell us what you think and give us ideas for what we should do next year if anything different. All right. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye, bye.